Ads, schmads. If you don't want ads, that's okay. Choose the Dave McWilliams Plus option on Apple Podcasts. And hey, presto, no ads. To understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. This podcast is powered by Acast. How are you doing there? It is time for the podcast. I've just asked John, not in any bizarre way, to lie down the couch there and I listen to his problems. It's my it's my Freudian moment of psychoanalyst or analysis with John. We were yeah. discussing. I'll pay you for that afterwards. I pay you for that to everyone, do you? Anyway, how are you, Ed? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. good. Actually, your word? I, oh, I, I, I have a new idea for for a marketing ploy. Oh, God. For this Here podcast. Go. go on, what do we do? Well, I was reading there the other day that uh, there's this pub in London, in Vauxhall in London. Okay. And they got name-checked on one of Taylor Swift's songs. And oh, the yeah. place is absolutely thronged with... With Taylor Swifties. With Swifties all over the place. And they're all looking for merch and all that kind of stuff. All we need to do, Mac... Is get Taylor Swift. Just Taylor, give us a shout out. Taylor, all is forgiven. Just give us one shout out. And then what the, this place will be... Just write rammed. a song about it. The place will be rammed with people looking for merch. Exactly. exactly. Anyway, we could talk about Taylor Swift, but we won't. Right. We won't, right? What I'm going to talk about this week, John, is two things caught my eye. One is not unique to Ireland, but Ireland is very emblematic of it, mm. which is the politics of housing. What happens to political parties that lose control, one, of the housing market, but maybe even two, of the narrative around the housing market, right? Okay, yeah. That is what is playing out in Ireland, in Britain, in America, in Canada, in Australia, in New Zealand, all the English-speaking yeah. countries. That's the first thing. And it's a demographic and it's a generational issue. The Swifties. And the... Precisely. Yeah. yeah, it's a revolution of the Swifties. Remember we did pitchfork economics? This is switchfork economics, okay? <laughs> right? This is, when the Swifties come for you, John, they will be having pitchforks. They will be going for you, right? But it's all about that. It's demographics. So we're going to talk about that against the background of something very interesting I saw, which there are many, many global surveys on happiness. Mm. And the usual rules apply, which is that the Scandies are always the happiest. Right? Yes. They're always the happiest. Yeah. Whatever's going on up there, they're always the happiest. Because it's a beautiful but place. I have, it's a beautiful place. It's well run, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Expensive period. But something has been very unusual in the last 18 and 24 months, and it is the following, right? 30 years ago, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the most unhappy people in the world were the citizens of former Soviet satellites and the Soviet Union. Right. after their society, their economy, their sense of themselves collapsed. All their young people left. They had massive depopulation. They still have. Mm. They had massive depopulation, massive brain drain. And there was a sense that these were shells of societies. And you saw that in all the happiness indicators, right? Mm. In the last 24 months, the most significant change in global happiness has been young people in the former Soviet republics and the Eastern Bloc, what we used to know as the Eastern Bloc. Mm. And the reason I'm obsessed about this at the moment, I'm reading Katja Heuer's book, Beyond mm. the Wall, about life in East Germany. Yes. She's coming to Dorky, fantastic book, right? right? Really, really brilliant. It's about daily life in, the, in what used to be called the German Democratic Republic, yeah. East Germany, right? Yeah. But I was reading this, and then, of course, it struck me is the reason these kids in these countries. So it's people under 30. Right. So it's 15 to 30. So maybe a little bit older for Swifties. So can, can I just ask you, that, so this is, when you sort of the former Eastern Bloc, but are you also saying that it's the Kazakhstan's, no, Uzbekistan? No, 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 not okay. the stands, right? Okay, okay. So it's the European Soviet Bloc. Gotcha. So it's Bulgaria, Romania, Serbia, mm. Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, and then, of course, the Baltics. Yeah. And Russia itself. But what you've seen, the most extraordinary thing is not in Russia or in Ukraine for obvious reasons, but young people in these other areas have become much, much happier. And I think there's a link between these two things. One is the generational conflict in Ireland and England and America and Canada, where young people are materially less happy than they were 10 years ago. Yeah. And Eastern blocs where young people are materially more happy. So I think the major issue here, if you look at everything, it's actually housing. House prices remain 
reasonable in most post-Soviet republics and in most Eastern Bloc countries. Okay. So younger people have a stake in those societies. So when the economy took off, eventually, when it began to recover and job opportunities were there, a lot of those Polish people living, for example, in all over Ireland, they went back. A lot yeah. of Romanians, yeah, yeah. they went back. A lot of Serbs, they went back. And they're going back to societies where the gap between wages and houses, rents and house prices, isn't that big. But they're also going back with some money in their pocket. They're going back with money in their pocket. Yeah. But the interesting thing is that money in their pocket isn't pushing prices up way beyond them. So right. what is actually yeah. happening is those societies are providing young people with the opportunity or at least the expectation that if I come back at 25 or if I don't leave, I can get a place of my own. I can move in with my boyfriend or girlfriend. I can possibly imagine having a family. I can imagine having a family unit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And the next thing you're going to see in those societies is the population going back up. They'll begin to have more children. Because one of the things that happened when the Soviet Union collapsed, one of the most depressing leading indicators of a lack of happiness, or more to the point, John, a lack of hope, mm. was they stopped having children. So their yeah. birth rates collapsed because yeah. yeah, yeah. they didn't want to bring children into the world. Yeah. But they were so traumatized. So what I want to do is this podcast is going to focus on the politics of housing in this part of the world and the consequences of getting your housing market, not right, but slightly better in Central and Eastern Europe, where what we see is young people are coming back and they're very happy. And when I say they're very happy, you get a country like Romania, which used to be the least happiest young people, and it's now surging. Yeah. And a lot of it's got to do with the fact that they can actually find affordable accommodation. So let me ask you then, in, was the great economic and financial crash of 2008, was that the watershed moment? Yes, it was. And it was the watershed moment for many, many things. Not just for, as we spoke about last week, the vast majority of economists missed it because they weren't, they, were, they didn't get out enough, yeah, right? Yeah, they weren't yeah, out yeah. enough, right? Yeah. But it was a watershed moment in what I would call the politics of housing. So although you know well, I didn't agree with the economics of those Bertie Ahern coalitions. Mm. But what I did really understand was his grasp on the politics of housing. So what Bertie Ahern did was that he created housing booms that everyone felt they could be part of. Now, whether it was a cynical ploy, whether it was accidental, whether it was far-sighted, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But I'm assuming there was a certain amount of political cynicism, opportunism, cunning, guile, all this. Yeah. So Bertie's basic idea was, look, we'll build loads of houses, we'll reward developers, we'll let the banks lend hand over fist, we'll look the other way, we will create an effervescent housing boom. Tax revenue will go up. Taxes, therefore, can be reduced and reduced and reduced. We will create, this is the point, a burgeoning class of first-time buyers. This is a new thing. Mm. We will create a burgeoning class of people who feel rich because of their houses. Now, what that does is that creates a feel-good factor around the place. Yeah. But it also does one thing which is very clever. It allies the interests of the not-so-young, right? So the 20-somethings and 30-somethings, mm. right? With the interests of their parents. Because they are both on a what I would call a wealth conveyor belt housing, which is going in the same way. Right. So the people in their 20s and 30s who bought those houses felt, look, we're on the pig's back here. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Right? Now, Bertie was rewarded. And Tony Blair. Same type of politician. Yeah. Tony Blair was a left-wing populist. Bertie was a sort of, I'm a socialist today, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a capitalist tomorrow, but he was a populist, right? Yeah. But both those types of politicians were rewarded with three, amazingly, three terms in office. I mean, that's unprecedented in democracies, right? Yeah. It's very difficult to do. So it means that you or your strategists have understood something fundamental about the society. And that fundamental thing was evidenced by John Howard, the Australian Prime Minister, who said, and I quote, I have never met anyone who complained about their house prices going up. I have mm. never met anybody who complained about house prices going up because they own 
their own houses. Yeah. So if you create this home owning democracy, and if you are able to enlist a significant majority into it, or you can promise those who aren't into it, you're going to be on this game in a couple of years. So you sit pretty and you play the game. What you do is you create an unbelievably strong and solid political power base that generates election wins for you. Mm. And the fascinating thing is that, and this is comes to the quick, is that although politicians in English-speaking countries that have large home-owning sectors always complain about house prices when they say, we'd love to bring house prices back. Mm -hmm, yeah. The secret is they don't want it. Yeah. The dirty little secret is they talk out of both sides of their mouth. They say, oh my God, the housing crisis is terrible, but they actually want house prices to keep increasing because those people will vote for the status quo and keep them back in. And Bertie Ahern, and again, for our non-Irish listeners, Bertie Ahern was a Taoiseach stroke prime minister here for three terms, very populist, very much man of the people. He was... A like, friend of yours. He was, like, he was no friend of mine. He was no friend of mine. And Yes, that's very true. It was immortalised, John, by the famous urge which he said. Yes, go kill I, yourself. I know, it's bonkers, isn't it? But I am, if nothing else, a forgiving chap, John. Yes, I've indeed. always been a indeed forgiving you chap. Are. But anyway, my point is, I'm looking at these things. I'm looking at this electoral success that those type of politicians, Blair and Ahern, mm. created. Almost Clinton-esque in their understanding of the way in which people vote, right? Yeah. You know, Clinton but, did something but, very, very similar. Yeah, but it, isn't, it would be true to say, though, that every successful politician is a populist. Yeah, but they understand something about the electorate, right? That's the key. Yeah. And I contrast this with the Faradkar, Simon Harris, Fine Gael-led coalitions, right? And what I can't understand for the life of me is this idea, well, I can understand it, is that Faradkar and Harris, much younger politicians, have lost the youth, mm. much more aligned socially with younger people on issues of abortion, of divorce, of LGBT rights. Green issues as Green well. issues as well. Yeah, so they're yeah. much more aligned, but they're getting no reward. So the young have completely abandoned them, right? Mm. Whereas Bertie hung around with developers, with fat cats in the Galway tent. You know, he absolutely and explicitly targeted middle-aged white lads on the up. There was no LGBT carry on with Bertie. Yeah. Bertie would never, ever have introduced an abortion referendum. No way in a million but, years. Let me... So I'm just saying, so it's interesting, but he understood something deep in the psyche, as Blair did too. Yeah. That people need to feel that they are on some sort of conveyor belt socially. Mm. And they need to feel that they're part of the society. And they have a word we use all the time, John, a stake. Yes, yeah. And what Faradkar Skin and Harris have done is the opposite. So we have the most bizarre situation here. So the Berties of this world engineered housing booms in order to get re-elected. Faradkar and Harris have a housing boom when they've never been more unpopular. Yeah, yeah. Because the fruits of the housing boom are going to buy to let investors who are foreign pension funds and investment funds in the main. And there's one thing we know for definite about politics is foreigners don't vote. Yeah. So local people vote. So if you jaundice your housing policy to reward foreign investors, you destroy and cannibalize your own political power base. And that's what's happening. And it's it's a fascinating way to look at it because what you look now is that the first time buyers, kind of Bertie's Fusiliers, mm. remember there was a thing called McAlpine's Fusiliers, yeah, yeah, yeah. with the Irish fellows who built England, right? Yeah, yeah. Bertie's Fusiliers were first time buyers. They were enlisted in his project, even though they didn't like what he stood for and they didn't like his politics and they didn't like his, his liberal or illiberal agenda, but they liked his economics. Yeah. They were enlisted and they became part of his tribe, these first-time buyers. Now, first-time buyers resent the centrist government, where in the old times, they actually held their noses and voted for centrists. Now they resent them. And the reason they resent them is probably the perception more than the reality that all the upside of the housing boom 
is going to foreigners. And not just foreigners, but pension funds. And pension funds reward yeah, yeah. old people. Yeah, yeah. But he, here's a question then. Is there then a parallel between Bertie's conservatism of the day and a lot of the Eastern European governments that are mostly conservative or have turned conservative yeah. in the last few years? Very good point, because they have turned anti-gay rights. Mm. They've certainly turned anti-immigration and they've certainly... Certainly Poland and Hungary. And lots of them are going pro-Russian as well, which is kind of bizarre as well. Yeah. They're, well, they're, they're ambivalent now, right? Some yeah. of them are, some of them are, right? But when I come back to that idea that what, we're, what we have is if houses are used as investments, if they're perceived as a way of getting rich, then you can only get re-elected if you give people the meaningful prospect of being able to acquire a house. Yeah. And this was Bertie's big shtick. It was a big marketing, big branding idea. You might not necessarily own a house, and you might not necessarily own a house where you want to own a house, but if you buy a place outside of Port Leash, mm. you're part of the gang. Yeah. And as long as you remain part of the gang... You're we'll, on the ladder. You're on the ladder and you're yeah. on the pig's back. Yeah. And we will look after you. Tony Blair did exactly the same thing in England, right? Yeah. Exactly the same thing, where he converted Tory sceptics who hated the Labour Party into aspirant, upwardly mobile Labour voters, something that never happened was before. He, was he responsible for Milton Keynes and places All like those this? things. where yeah, they, used yeah. to, they used to have these, these bellwethers, right? Yeah, yeah. Mondeo Western Man. Western Mayor. All those places, yeah. Chipping Norton and all these places, right? <laughs> Chipping it, Norton's lovely, actually. <laughs> never been there, but exactly the same. I just like the name of it. I like the name of it. But that sort of idea, right? So we come back to it, come back, right? If one sector of the population endures housing because housing is a cost through rents. And another section of the population enjoys housing because housing is an increase in their asset value. You split the electorate down the middle mm. and you split them on demographic lines. And this is exactly what Varadkar and Harris, despite being much younger and despite being much closer in age and attitude to yeah. young people, yeah, yeah. they have succeeded in alienating their own class and their own demographic, which is an extraordinary, extraordinary underachievement for the center parties. So they have had a housing boom that they get no upside from. So so as we started with, 2008 was kind of a watershed, maybe not the exact point of, of change, but why did this happen? How come this current government, who have been in power for... Over 10 years. Yeah, yeah. are getting it so wrong. But before you get into that, hang on, let's go for a little break. So, Mike, what we're talking about is housing and this phrase that you've used that some people, half the population, enjoy their property, housing. Yes. And the other half, or maybe more than half, are enduring it. Endure the cost of it, yeah. Endure the cost of it. Yeah. So, how did this come about? You know, because no, at good, one stage really we question. had a booming economy, housing economy, and now it's all gone well, uh, our ways. Well, it's, it's, it's not that it's all gone our ways. It's that the people who are benefiting most from housing price increases and rent increases in Ireland are largely perceived as being foreign. Mm. That's the first thing. The second thing then is the idea that housing used to unify the centre and it now divides the centre. And these are two enormous consequential moments. It is because the Irish banks went spectacularly bust mm. in 2008. Mm. Not one Irish bank, not one Irish bank did not need a government bailout of some sort or another. Yeah. The perception was that those banks, once they became recapitalized, would begin to operate as they used to do. How do you mean? They would support and lend to first-time buyers. Right. We would support and lend to Irish developers. And we would go back to a similar model of banking, housing, development that had got us into the problem, but we'd do it and start at a much lower level. Right. The perception also was that there was a fire sale in Ireland. Like, Ireland was put, put for sale, mm. right? And the idea was that, yeah, the fire sale... Those assets will be bought up by rich Irish people and our rich foreigners. And there will be a moment where they will make out like bandits. The rest will suffer. But over time, yeah. 
the pendulum will swing back and Irish people will broadly become what we were before. And this is the same for the UK, and it's the same for Canada, and it's the same for the United States. A sort of bank-led property democracy. Okay. So that's why, so for example, when you when you listen to even the Irish left, they are so against buy to let, even though the left in almost every other country is against people owning houses as assets because they are called rentiers. Okay. They are called drones by Karl Marx. Yeah. Wouldn't have enjoyed this idea at all. Yeah. That people <laughs> should sit and own property. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. That's what he said. But even the left in Ireland won't introduce a property tax. So even the left in Ireland have understood one thing, which is the following, that Ireland, since its inception, had a very, very unique approach to housing, which was the following. Irish states subsidised what we used to call corporation houses. But we made those houses available to corporation tenants to buy before anybody else. Now, you might remember people who used to follow British politics in the late 1980s or the early 1980s. Mrs. Thatcher yeah. made council houses available to buy. That was, so was the first time I heard that the term gerrymandering. Jerry Mandarin, yeah. who, who we know was a person. Yes. He was a person, yeah. We discovered that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But I do remember yeah, that right. so, scandal, yeah. And there was, there was a big thing in the UK is, oh my good God, how could she possibly do something so radical as to sell off council houses cheaply to people who were financed by private banks? Mm. Ireland's been doing this since the 1930s. Really? We, we have been doing this as the explicit policy of Fianna Gael and Fianna Fáil since the independence of the state was to make corporation houses available to tenants to buy cheaply. Why? Because that would create the ballast of society, that people would all have a stake in society. It does not, not go is... against the basic uh, idea of a corporation house. Exactly. So the point is, so the Irish state subsidised housing to use as an instrument of social engineering. Yeah. And the subsidy it gave to housing it didn't give to health or education. So this is a fascinating, fascinating thing. So okay. most other post-Second World War countries, the state owned the houses yeah. and therefore didn't subsidise them as much as the Irish state did. But they used the money they would have used subsidising houses to give free health and free education. Okay. Ireland yeah. didn't do this. We allowed the Catholic Church to continue to own the health and education yes. system. Yes, right? yeah. And in, so when most countries would use those systems to basically increase the lot of and the social position of working people, mm. we didn't do that. We did something much more weird. Yeah. We subsidised council houses. We, we, to nuns and Christian brothers running nuns, schools and nuns, hospitals. Nuns Christian brothers running schools and hospitals and working people buying council houses way below the market price. That was the Irish model, right? right? Okay, okay. Yeah. it's totally unique. But was this De Valera's big idea? Or? It was a combination of De Valera. It was also Cosgrave. It was also right. Costello. I mean, this is the weird part. This is, goes back to this weird part of the Irish psyche and housing. The reason Irish people like to buy houses is because every single government has made it almost a home run. Mm. Buy your house, you'll be grand. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so when Mrs. Thatcher introduced, oh my God, people are buying council houses in England. We've been doing that on the sly for decades beforehand, right? right? Yeah, yeah. And to come back to this point, the Irish banks after 2008 have become nothing more than safe deposit boxes for Irish savings. They have, in many ways, they don't exist as a banking sector. Number one, many of the banks that were here disappeared. Mm i.e. they left. There is no competition in the banking sector. Yeah, yeah. There's no aggressive player that is offering mortgages at 2 or 3% or 2%. Irish banks are making money, not because they're lending money, but because they're robbing depositors. Yeah. So as interest rates rose, they didn't pass them on. So they just simply got a free... The ECB might as well be writing them a check every week. And they're posting huge profits. They won't support small businesses. They won't support... Small developers. But all the right? ads say they do. But they don't, right? So, for example, in the old days, there used to be developers, builder developers, who do 20 houses, right? Mm. And below them, like little fires burning all over the place. Yeah. They're all gone. There's only massive big developers. Yeah. And those massive big developers aren't even being financed by Irish banks. So the ones you see all over here. Okay. They are being financed by debt companies. 
So they are going to large companies and they're saying, we need 20 million quid from you. And they say, okay, well, we'll give you this financing at 4%. We'll give you this mezzanine financing at 8%. And we'll give you blah, blah, blah. We do this, right, right. So mezzanine financing. I know, it's, 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 it's Mickey Mouse. It's, it's yeah. the middle bit <laughs> of the financing, right? But what we've seen, therefore, is an entire system where all the financial imperatives has gone towards the bigger players because the Irish banks just couldn't be bothered doing it. <laughs> That's what I think is happening. Right. Okay. And the reason they couldn't be bothered doing it is they're not passing on interest rate increases. So they're getting passive income all the time. And into the drone gap, banks. Drone banks. Like, oh, we're like that one. Into the gap come the foreign players. Right. Now the interesting thing is, so I'll just give you a great example. And the the net result of that is profound anxiety on the part of the people in Ireland who can't get houses. Yes. Eurobarometer poll, spring 2023, last year, 61% of people in Ireland cited housing as one of the two most important issues facing the country in comparison to 10% of people across the EU on average. Wow. So okay. we are six times more worried about it than anybody else. Why? Because we are, A, this is the first generation that has been shafted. Mm. And the reason we are more anxious about it is because Irish young people understand that part of the social contract was this subsidization of houses, either through, you know, first-time buyers' grants, mm. yep. and this, that, yep. and the other, right? Or buying your own council house mm. after a while. So what you see is this bizarre situation where even though in reality... The buy-to-let market isn't absolutely huge. And I'll give you the figures, right? Like in reality, right, last year on housing completions in Ireland, first-time buyers bought 32% of all houses that were built, right? Owner-occupiers, they bought 24%. They're rich parents buying for their kids, in effect. Okay, yeah. Right? The state bought one house in every five that was built. So the state is buying houses. Okay. And institutional investors only bought 18% of all the completions, but they bought in places like Dublin City and Cork City, in the apartments. So the apartments in Dublin 1 and Dublin 2, those blocks mm. are largely and overwhelmingly by to let owned by foreigners. Yeah. And that has created the perception that when young people go to buy a flat in town, they're outbid by a foreign. They're not even outbid, they're not even allowed play the game. Yeah. And so yeah. therefore we go back from that, John. So therefore those younger people, they are enduring house price increase through their cost of rent while the people who are enjoying this are foreign pension funds mm. and foreign pension funds enrich old foreigners. So if you were a Marxist, John. Yeah, I am. You are. Yeah, you are actually, yeah. <laughs> okay, so if you're a Marxist, yes you are, right? <laughs> what you would understand is that precisely what Marx suggested is happening, which is young local workers are financing old fat cat investors. And this has been done by a right-wing coalition government, right? Think about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Orchestrated by Faradkar and Harris and all these guys. And what, what is bizarre to me, John, is they don't even seem to understand this. This is the weird thing that, you know, when you join up the dots, you think, okay, Bertie O'Hare and Tony Blair may have been cynical politicians, but they understood what they were doing. When I listen to Simon Harris and I listen to Varadkar, and even when I listen to all the others, right, they don't seem to be able to make this connection that the reason they are so unpopular is because they have broken, and now you might have said the social contract wasn't a good one, but they've broken the very essence of the social contract. And that's the same thing that's happened in the UK too, right? Are you, are you saying though, oh my God, I can't believe you're saying this, but you're not, that bring back Bertie? No, I'm not because, uh, no, because eventually, like, you know, as I, as, I, as I told Bertie to his face and on telly a thousand times over those years, this thing's going to blow up in your face. Yeah. What I'm saying is that if a political class doesn't understand why it is unpopular, it doesn't deserve to be elected. That's what I'm saying. And this political class seems to me not to have been able to join up the dots. Or they realise far too late that they've actually given away the family silver to somebody else. 
And now they're trying desperately over the course of the next 18 months to come up with some overarching policy that's going to get them out of this particular hole that they're in. But all they have to do is realize that they have created a situation where we are in a housing boom and the incumbent political class is not rewarded. And that is catastrophic miscalculation. Where's me pitchfork? 